Well, thanks for showing up. This is going to be a relatively short and simple demo, but I wanted to do it to sort of catch up on all the little things that have been done uh, so that we can move on to bigger things. And the first one of these is actually pretty interesting and has some implications. And I'm calling it implicit polymorphism, which is a really a big mouthful for a simple thing. So that's not really what it's called. It's just the name of this demo, because I don't have a better name right this second. Um, so, uh, well, let's, let's compile and run the program, and we'll look at the output. You know, you know the drill. So we're compiling it. That's great. <laughs> it compiles in 0.287 seconds, 0.27 of which are the linker. Linkers, I don't, I don't understand linkers. All right, so we're just printing a bunch of stuff. And uh, we'll go into what all that is. Let me, let me clear screen. All right, so let's talk about polymorphic structs as demoed previously. Um, so you know, you may have seen that you can make a struct and it can take parameters and those parameters, you know, like, uh, you know, template style parameters to procedures, um, help define the type, right? So this struct, before you specify the parameters, is some kind of like abstract type, and then it becomes concrete. You know, for a hash table, when you say what the key type and the value type are, then it knows what the types are of all these data structures and can instantiate that type, right? And so up till now, there's sort of been two ways to write procedures that take this kind of thing as an argument, polymorphic. Right, so uh, I'm going to go through a couple of them here. So if we want to add something to a hash table, right? Well, we want to take a table, and then a key and a value. And how do you specify the table? Well, one way is to just do pattern matching on the table. Say, well, it's some table with some key type and some value type, right? And then you can use the key type and the value type in your other arguments, or in the return values, or in the procedure. And and that seems good. It seems like a good way to do it. Uh, there's some problems with having to specify it this way. First of all, you've got to type this every time, right? Secondly, it is a little bit cryptic. Like, if you happen to know what K and V mean, great. If you don't, uh, you know, that's not so great. So maybe you want to use longer names in here, but it's, it's a little bit, if you're coming from C++ and D especially, it's like traditional to use shorter names in here, I think. So that's just how people tend to do it. Um, but the other problem is that this is not robust to changes in this declaration, right? So if I add an argument, I have to go to every procedure that takes one of these guys and specify the third argument, um, even if I don't particularly care about that argument, right, or about what it does to the struct. Or God forbid that I swap these two arguments, both of which are type expressions, right, then I'm really in trouble because all these procedures will compile now, probably, um, and it's, it's not so easy to go and hunt them all down. So, you know, this looks terse, um, but it's not so terse if you have to type it all the time, and it has some disadvantages. Um, another way to do it that I added around that time is to say, well, you use regular polymorphism like it's some T, some type, we don't know, but we've got a shorthand for type matching. Uh, we just say, well, it's a table of some kind, right? Um, and this is so that you don't have to write a modify procedure of your own. You could write, as we've demoed before, an arbitrarily complex procedure that inspects the type and decides if you accept it or not. But this is a shorthand way of not having to write all that stuff. Um, Now you can still get at all the aspects of the thing. So, you know, when we said key K here, uh, you know, that was our way of getting at this, which is this, right? Well, here we could just say, well, key is table.key type and value is table.value type. And it looks longer, but it's actually, uh, it's a little bit readable if you're coming up and looking at this, right? Um, for the first time, or you haven't looked at it in a long time. So you can still get, even though you didn't pattern match those arguments here, 
uh, you can still get it done, right? And so that's fine. Um, now, prior to this demo, those two were sort of the only way to do it. Um, but what was sort of not being said in previous demos is that the language had not yet assigned a meaning to the third sort of thing that you might do, which is this. Uh, so, you know, this part is the same as for this previous declaration, but what if we just say this argument is a pointer to a table, right? What does that mean? And I held off on defining the semantics of that for a long time uh, because I was thinking I wanted it to mean something like uh, this, the struct that represents uh, what is invariant to all tables. And the reason why I was thinking that was because when I program using templates in C++, I'm trying to get out of templates as soon as possible, right? I'm only using them for what I absolutely have to, and then I try to call into regular procedures. And I was thinking, well, you know, for table, if you look at these, right, these two things don't affect anything down until here, right? So in terms of memory layout and, uh, you know, in terms of size and position in memory and all that stuff and type, all these things are invariant among all tables. So maybe there should be a declaration of, of something that means that. And I was thinking for a while that that is what this would mean, but then I changed my mind. So that's not what it means. Um, and the reason I changed my mind is that some other features that are going to be demoed later uh, are very much about using polymorphism very heavily because as I've been using this language, I've been finding I don't mind it because it's a lot more clean than C++ and it's certainly faster to compile, right? They don't bloat your compile times and you get good error messages. And for all those reasons, um, I like using polymorphic procedures here much more than I like using templates in C++, right? So I said, well, um, let's instead, uh, well, let, well, I'll just say that because of those reasons, I wasn't so eager to get out of polymorphism all the time, right? So then there's, um, I'll just say what I've defined this to be, uh, and then, um, and then we'll talk about why, what, what the advantage is. And, and what this means is actually um, this. So, you know, when you say pointer to table and table is polymorphic and it takes arguments, now what that means is uh, just implicitly there's a bunch of parameters with no names that get pattern matched, but it doesn't matter because the names don't, meet, don't assign to anything, right? Um, so basically, anytime you take a polymorphic argument, you can just say pointer to that. And I'll, I'll explain why that's good, right? Um, oh, I forgot, hold on. I forgot to switch back after the last time. This program has two modes. So th this is how it's supposed to be. Let me, let me recompile and rerun. Recompile, rerun. Clear, rerun. Okay, so let's say you start with a very simple struct, like you're programming your program and, uh, you know, it's just, um, starts out simple as programs usually do. So I've got this counter that's supposed to count, it's got a name and it's got a result and I'm just gonna keep adding to the result, right? So I've got this procedure increment that takes a pointer to one of these guys and adds one to the result and I can print the result, right? So I take this guy, and I say print the name, right? And so here I'm in instantiating one, I'm incrementing it, and then I'm printing the result. And so the output is counter hello sailor has result one. So that's all very straightforward. Now the problem is, of course, the program isn't what you write instantaneously. It evolves over time, right? As you're working on a project, it evolves. And you might decide later on, well, this counter, you know, I really want to have, uh, you know, different types of them, or, or I, want, I want the result, the thing that I'm counting, sometimes to be an unsigned 8-bit number because I want it to be small, or maybe sometimes it needs to be float. So I'm going to add an argument here, right, of uh, some type that's the type of the counter, and result is going to be t, right? Now, as soon as you do this, under the old scheme, you would have had to go to every single method and done something like this, right, 
Um, and that's just, it's a little bit ugly because now, um, like a small change here shouldn't affect very much. It shouldn't infect the rest of your program, right? You shouldn't have to go making all your procedure declarations more complicated. And it doesn't look that much more complicated if there's only one argument and it's only this one type, but if you start having a lot of arguments, um, it gets substantially more involved, right? And so the point of this uh, that I was talking about here is that you can make the leap from your struct having no arguments to having arguments and um, it doesn't matter, right? So now the, the only time you really need to specify the arguments is when you construct it. And actually, I didn't test this, um, but I, I should be able to give this a default value. This is when I'm crossing my fingers that a bug hasn't crept in. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a, eh, that should work. It doesn't work yet. Anyway, <laughs> so, so if I don't, uh, if I don't specify it, uh, or, or let me just say, when I instantiate one of these, if I give arguments, so in this block of code I'm giving arguments, um, then I can use all the same procedures on it. So here I'm going to make a counter with a U8 argument, right? And I'm giving it a name, U8 counter. And here I'm going to make a counter with a float argument, and I'm giving it a name, float counter, right? Then I'm going to increment each of them and print the result. And those increment and print result are the same ones that I used before I added the argument, right? And so uh, let's compile again, and we'll run again. And, and uh, now we say counter u8 counter has result 2 and counter float counter has result 3.000 and this is an unsigned 8 bit too. So now you have a lot of versatility where you know you can make an edit. Maybe I even just wanted to try for five minutes what happens if I give a parameter to this and then I decided no nah, I didn't want to do that right. So when your program doesn't have to change a lot syntactically to do that experiment it's a low cost experiment whereas if you make it a huge cliff to make something polymorphic uh, then it's painful. So it's just to say that that is the direction in which I'm making this design decision right now, is that um, it, there isn't a syntactical uh, difference between a polymorphic argument and a non-polymorphic argument necessarily. You still can do this stuff where you pattern match and whatever, but you don't have to. Um, yeah, so... Um, just to show that this is polymorphic and instantiates the two different types, I'm calling, so again, you know, this isn't doing pattern matching or anything. It looks like a specific type. Uh, it, it looks like, it looks like a type that nothing scary is happening with. And I can call it with both D and E here, which are counters of different types. And, you know, that's, that's what these big masses of text are. But you can see that they're different. So, um, you know, they come from the same source struct that ends in D000, but, you know, this one's uh, initializer is this, and this one's initializer is a different address, and there was a runtime size. Uh, run, does anyone see runtime size? Here it is, it's, it's breaking over. This one's 20 runtime size, and this one is 17. 17. Uh, 17. So, um, there you go. So it's a, it's a shorthand. We're making it easier to work with polymorphic things. You don't have to go and annotate all your procedures. And then you might say, well, I mean, I want to know from the program text whether it's polymorphic or not. And I would have thought that was important a couple years ago, but I, polymorphism is good enough now in this language that I don't feel that way. And I also think that that's something your IDE can just tell you. So uh, I'm not worried about that. Um, there's a, there's a subtlety that I want to talk about, which is that, um, th so this thing is basically now syntactic sugar for this thing. Um, these two things have different semantics, though, which is interesting. So um, in, the ex in the instance, re you know, recall you can do a thing that's a little bit like C++ base classes, where, you know, you can say I'm using another struct, which is more like a has a relationship than an inheritance relationship, you can still pass it to procedures that take that kind of argument. Um, in this case, uh, 
imagine you, you have a struct that is using a table of some particular type, right? In this case, you'll get the table. So the type of table will definitely be a table. In this case, the type of table will be whatever the struct is that implements or has a table because this slash notation right now doesn't force you to cast all the way down. So these aren't exactly redundant syntax. They have actually different outcomes in terms of the type of the argument in some cases. And so this has the same outcome as, as this one. Probably that's a detail that nobody but me cares about right now, but that's just how it is. Uh, so that's thing number one. And that's actually the most complicated thing. The other two things are just really simple. I just wanted to throw them in to uh, have enough to talk about. Um, so the second thing is, uh, you know, for a long time, you've been able to say type info of some type. And we've demoed that a number of times. Um, and what that returns, which we've also shown many times, is one of these type info structs. And the idea is like, OK, you get one of these. You can look at the tag, and you can use that to cast it down to one of these other types. And this is when some people say, oh, oh, I want some types, some types, or tag unions, tag unions. And it's like, OK, fine. You know, we might do that later. Doesn't matter, because the actual functionality is the same, right? So there's this relationship where these are more specific than this base type. And most of the time, uh, when you said type info, it would return this base type, you know, even though the other information was there, as, as far as the type checker knew, it was this. Um, and that, I think I did that just for simplicity's sake or something, but it's inconvenient sometimes. Because you could say type info of like an enum and know that it's a type info enum pointer, but you still have to cast it, which is a little bit verbose. Um, so now, uh, as of this demo, type info returns the most specific one of these. So if it's a pointer, it's going to give you something that the compiler knows is a type info pointer, right? It's not, it's not opaque. It doesn't, uh, it can see past the fact, whatever. I'm, I'm just saying the same thing different ways now. We'll demo it, right? So here um, I've got an x that's 5, so that's going to default to integer. I've got p, which is a pointer to x. Right? So when I get the type of that, which is some type, right? and I'm going to get the type info of that, which is a struct describing the type, and I'm assigning that to info, and then I'm printing info. Type info of p is blah. And you'll see it's actually a type info pointer. Right? So I didn't get a vanilla type info and have to cast it up. It just gave me the right thing. Right? And then just to show that that works through polymorphism and all this stuff, we've got this thing that takes some argument of any type, um, and we take the type info of whatever the type is, and we just say the type info is blah, and I just run that on a bunch of stuff. So it's on a string, and an int, and a float, and a float64, and you just start seeing string, integer, float. Uh, oh, float64 is not a float64, it's a type called float64, right? So that's uh, type info of type type. So some. Some things don't have any further information, right? So type and void and stuff like that don't have specific substructs of type info, so they just give you a type info with the tag. That's what I'm demoing there. Um, you know, there's an enum here, and you know, we get that, so it's a type info enum that tells you how to get at the information and all the names and that good stuff. And uh, you know, this one, here's a catalog uh, that, that we saw earlier. Um, or no, didn't we? I don't know. It's a, it's a parameterized type. And again, that turns into a type info struct. And pointer to catalog gives you a type info pointer. So it's just to say that you get the most specific thing. And it's handy. So people have probably, people who've watched a lot of the live coding streams have seen me cast that before in cases when it maybe felt like I shouldn't need to. And now I don't need to. Lastly, this one's a little goofy. Um, oh, there's a question. How does this automatic subtype casting work with runtime types? Uh, if you mean, um, I mean, there isn't such a thing as a runtime type. You mean, if you, if you mean you're using something at runtime, there are cases 
when you might not know the type, right? So there might be just a procedure that takes a type info, right? And then you would have to cast back up from inside this, but the reason why you went down to type info is so that anybody could call it commonly without you having to know what the thing is, right? Um, like somebody could call f with a type info struct and this would cast down to type info and then blah blah blah, right? But if you didn't want to cast down, you could do this and then you would have the type info struct inside the procedure. Um, one case, uh, so a case when you wouldn't uh, know the type at all is, you know, if this is an any, which is a runtime uh, thing, <laughs> um, it's a way of accepting an argument and not making a polymorphic procedure, right? And so this gives you a pointer to the data and a pointer to type info, right? And, and that's just a pointer to the base type info and you would then have to cast up as you would have before. Yeah, the catalog is user code. It's just a random struct that I declared. Um, if you watch the animation streams from the past few days, I've been using those. It's not built into the language at all. Okay, so the last thing I did was I got annoyed at how misaligned things are. Like this, this syntax where we have, you know, a colon and whatnot, and the name on the left uh, seems to lend itself to lining things up nicely. But then often things on the left aren't lined up because, you know, names will be of different lengths. Often you'll be doing parallel operations of two or three things that are very similar and you want them to visually group together and they would look like this, which is like a little bit messy. So I extended the lexer to uh, accept a backslash in the middle of an identifier. So you can have a backslash and then any number of spaces and it's as though they weren't there. Uh, so in this case, I can line up these names and uh, get something that's neater to read. Um, the backslash looks annoying if it's as bright as the rest of the text, so I have my syntax highlighting set up to de-emphasize it. Um, I don't usually type in camel case, but I actually feel like this looks cleaner in camel case because something about the underscore... Maybe I should de-emphasize underscores in my... Uh, like, I feel like if underscores generally looked like that backslash does, code would probably be re more readable. Maybe not. Um, anyway, though, that's just a cute thing. Uh, you know, this code doesn't print anything or whatever. It's just to show that it compiles and works. I played around with other characters besides backslash, like maybe a single tick or a back tick because they're smaller visually. Um, and, you know, I don't care too much what character it is. I'm not even sure if this is going to be in in the long term. It's just how it is today. Uh, that is everything that I wanted to demo. Like I said, it's a short demo. Um, let's do on-topic questions. If there's any questions about what I just showed, uh, please ask. What if you put the underscore before the backslash? I did that earlier, and 